The first and second chronicles, like the books of Samuel and Kings, originally formed one volume. It's good to keep this organic unity in mind. The book's original title was Words of Days or Daily Journal. The Septuagint called it omissions, emphasizing the material in them that is supplemental to the books of the kings. For example, 1 Chronicles adds the following to our knowledge of the period. The preparing of the building material for the temple by David. The Levitical divisions and their responsibilities in the priestly service and David's last encouragement and exhortation to the nation and to his son Solomon. Chronicles is a historical compilation, probably by Ezra. If you compare the last paragraph of 2 Chronicles with the first one of Ezra, you'll see they're identical. It is, as noted, a compilation, with the following sources mentioned for the two volumes. The books of the kings of Israel and Judah, as well as the writings of Samuel, Nathan, Gad, Ahijah, Iddo, Shemaiah, Jehu, Isaiah, and what are called the sayings of the seers. The book of 1 Chronicles encompasses the widest scope of any in the Old Testament, beginning with Adam and continuing through to the reign of Solomon, covering everything but the division, decline, and departure into captivity, covered in 2 Chronicles. However, the material has been selected with great care to provide the divine view of history. A very fruitful study is a side-by-side -side comparison of the Chronicles with the books of Samuel and Kings. Some accounts are reinforced by repetition, others are obvious by omission, and still others are accentuated by addition. All this is meant to highlight the working of God in history. The Lord obviously thought it to be essential to outline his ways at a time when Israel was scattered among the Gentiles, her king deposed and her capital in ruins. Where was God? Was the messianic hope finished? The answer is, God is right where he's always been, declares the chronicler. At times, he's hidden his face, but every promise he's made will certainly come to pass. Chapters 1 to 9 give us a skeleton view of human history from Adam to David. As we draw to the end of the genealogies, it seems we take a side trip in chapter 10 to Gibeon, but it's to introduce us to the family of Israel's first king, Saul. Having done this, it simply paints the dismal backdrop of his disobedience, failure, defeat, and death, against which shines the life of David, minus his failures. One key reason for the book, to explain to those returning from exile why the kingly line runs through David's family in Judah, not Saul's family in Benjamin. The main portion of the book, chapters 11 to 29, is devoted to David's rule, especially as it pertains to the worship of Jehovah. It begins with his pouring out a drink offering to the Lord, chapter 11, and continues through the return of the ark, chapters 13 to 16, and his desire to build the Lord's house, chapter 17 his purchase of Ornan's threshing floor, chapter 21, and preparation of the temple's material, chapter 22, concluding with the ordering of the service of God and the ascent of Solomon in glory. Yet behind it all, we can't help but feel that the chronicler is pointing forward to one greater than Solomon, whom David his father acknowledged as his Lord. And that's our scripture snapshot of First Chronicles.